Before we begin today's program, I'd like to announce that Michael Serion and I will be doing a six-part program series together here on Red Ice Radio starting July 6th at 1 p.m. Pacific on bbsradio.com. During this six-part series, we'll also be having a contest and you'll have the opportunity to win one DVD per program from Michael Sarian's acclaimed DVD series, Origins and Oracles. The first person to call us live during the show with the correct answer will win. So make sure you stay tuned to Red Ice Radio and red-ice.net for more information about this series and the contest. And don't forget, our first live program is July 6th at 1 p.m. Pacific on bbsradio.com. To find out more about Michael Tsarian and his work, check out his website, terroscopes.com. Truth against the world. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Red Ice Radio. Thank you for tuning in to bbsradio.com or if you are listening from the archives sometime in the future this is Henrik Palmgren coming to you from the west coast of Sweden I am the editor of the website red-ice.net and I am your host Uh, today we have a very special guest with us I'm very excited about this program Uh, author and researcher Brad Steiger is with us Uh, He is a titan within the field of ufology, uh, all the things mysterious, the occult, and things commonly referred to as the paranormal. And um, I recently bought a copy of uh, Brad and Sherry Steiger's latest book, uh, Conspiracies and Secret Societies, The Complete Dossier. And uh, it's an encyclopedia filled with interesting topics uh, within the world of uh, conspiracies, uh, meaning... (laughs) simply the world that uh, you and I live in, of course, but uh, unfortunately, at, at, uh, as things are at the moment, uh, um, a world that the majority of people are uh, unaware of, it seems, but here is where the beauty of this book uh, comes in, because it is like a, a crash course uh, into the co- these controversial subjects, and uh, even more wonderful is that it uh, simply presents the available theories without making uh, conclusions or making suggestions on how you should uh, interpret these theories. And uh, I wanted to have Brad on today to talk about some of the fascinating subjects in the book, but uh, also maybe to meander uh, into a few other topics. I certainly want to hear more from Brad's unique perspective. I know that he has been researching these kinds of subjects for some time now, and uh, I can only guess uh, at how he sees uh, the so-called research community and how it has changed over the years, and certainly with the advent of the Internet. So it's going to be fascinating to hear uh, more from Brad. Uh, so uh, hello and welcome to the program, Mr. Steiger. Thank you very much, and please, Henrik, just call me Brad. Ah, okay, <laughs> Brad it is. <laughs> Thank you for uh, you know taking the time to be here. I know you're busy in writing on another book, so I really yeah, uh, appreciate just coming it. to the very uh, k- kind of the little uh, smoothing out parts now. Oh. Yeah, that's what that's the stage it's in right now. <laughs> Great, and uh, you know before we we dive into uh, some of the subjects in the book here, and uh, I'd really like to know uh, you know a, a, just a little bit about your background. Of course, it's it, this uh, program is as we said just an hour about, so uh, we certainly don't have time to cover it all, but you know, how, how long have you been researching the, these kinds of subjects now? Well, I could give the melodramatic answer and say all my life, ah. <laughs> because uh, the house in which I was reared was the, uh, well, my one side of the family immigrated from Norway in the 1880s when there was really a great you know, Scandinavian uh, immigration. and mm. So the house that was built on the home place, as we call it, uh, was for my, my great-great-grandparents. Yeah. And when I was just a child, I could... It seemed like every night... This man and this woman 
would stand beside my bed. And I, I didn't recognize them. And they were very stern-faced, and they were, they were dressed. But yet I would hide my head under the covers, and then I would come out, and they're still there. Mm. And I'd hide my head. They're still there. And finally I decided, well, they're not going to harm me. <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> well, it wasn't until years later that I saw that that was uh, my great-grandparents, Ole and Merritt, standing there. Oh. Because I, I found some pictures of them, and, and that's who it was. So I grew up in a house that had been a former stagecoach stop. So we mm. had all kinds of <laughs> phenomena there. We would get up in the middle of the night, and you'd swear, you know, that a horse and wagon had just come down the lane. <laughs> We'd get up, and there's no one there. And so I, I became accustomed, and it, it took me a while because... Uh, I'm I'm a country person, I, and, yeah. and in those days when I grew up, I'm I'm 70 years old now. So we go back, and in the 30s in the United States, uh, where we lived, you know, it's still pretty remote, mm. and uh, I didn't really, I wasn't really exposed to other children very much until I went to school. Uh, I could speak English. Many of my cousins couldn't. Ah, okay. <laughs> and, and so there's quite a, you know, we, we, uh, we identify so much with what's happening in America now. Yeah. But uh, I didn't realize that other children probably weren't aware and, and didn't see some of the things that I saw. So mm. I can say it's all my life, but I became really, I, I say for just to round it off, that I've been researching the field for 50 years because I was probably in my late teens and uh, 20, when I was 20, that I began really seriously uh, attending uh, spiritualist camps, uh, investigating mediums, and trying to understand myself what had happened in the childhood home. Yeah. And then I had a near-death experience at age 11, and mm. that really, I mean, that that altered my life. Yeah, that changed imagine. my life. Uh, I was, until that time, well, people still thought, I mean, all of my life, people thought I should be a Lutheran minister when I grew up. <laughs> so I was programmed that way. Uh -huh. Every Sunday school program, every Christmas pageant, I was the narrator. E even when I was uh, nine and ten years old, <laughs> And this was all the way up to uh, high school, but I, I was the narrator. Hmm. And everyone thought, oh, what a fine minister he will make. Well, after <laughs> my near-death experience, I, I said, you know, what I want to do is to prove that what the pastor is up there talking about every Sunday yeah. is real. Exactly. <laughs> we, we don't have to accept it by faith alone. Yeah. We, can, we can we can research it. We can demonstrate it. We can prove it. Yeah. So that became my mission in life, Henrik. Ah, wonderful. And and of course, uh, just as you say, this it seems to be almost uh, the the other way around sometimes uh, within the, the Christian community that we yes. you know that we shouldn't uh, research these kinds of things and that we should leave it leave it alone and. Uh, have you come up against uh, a lot of, uh, you know, resistance to the kind of work oh, that you do? goodness, yes. Goodness, yes. When I started, uh, certainly. Um, and, and, you know, now here in the United States, and I know email that I get from abroad uh, also indicates that there, there's kind of a great revival of the paranormal. Yeah. It's never gone away, but uh, let, let's, let's rephrase that. Not a revival, but a a surge of interest right now. Yeah. And uh, here in the United States, we have uh, ghost hunting groups. Yeah. Frankly, uh -huh. every town over 500 has a ghost <laughs> hunting club. <laughs> and, and these people, God bless them, but you know, they've, they've read three books and they've seen a special on television, so yeah. they think they're experts. They think they're ghost hunters. Yeah. <laughs> well, in my opinion, you know, it takes years of research and experience and and discipline and discernment yeah. and, and learning, all, all of these things before you can dare say that. But when I started out, oh, the uh, I, I, before a radio program, yeah. you 
you were very courteous, and we said kind things to each other. In those days, someone would say, Steiger, when we get on the air, I'm going to rip you to shreds. <laughs> uh, how, how would you like <laughs> To go on the air with that introduction. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> My God, I'm nightmare. going to expose you as the <laughs> devil worshiper you are. Uh, I'm going to expose you as the Satanist you are. Mm. I mean, it, it uh, in those, and I still get, but I haven't really for years because my approach is, hey, you know, that's all right. <laughs> if if that's what you believe and you're comfortable and it gets you through the night, yeah. that's all that matters. Of course. But I'm just, I'm not a missionary, but I'm just presenting yeah. some evidence, and it's up to you. I'm it's not a like salesman, you. I'm not a missionary, I think I'm a teacher, I think I'm an educator, but whether you want to be in my classroom is up to you. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's very, it's beautifully said, and, and also that's one thing I really like about your, uh, your latest uh, book, uh, Conspiracies and secret societies. Uh, that it's you know it's it simply presents the uh, some of the available theories and and the different angles and approaches. And you know, it, as you say, it's up to uh, the reader and the um, the listener to to um, to, to make uh, up their own mind about this. And and maybe that's why some uh, there have been some uh, you know um, how should I say it. Uh, some resistance to this material because it also, you know, uh, suggests that you have to think for yourself and and to uh, to uh, process this kind of information, and that might be dangerous in some circles, also, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and and a lot of people, let's let's be honest, Henrik, they're lazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they're intellectually lazy. Yeah. I mean, television is is a marvelous instrument used properly. But we have just too many couch potatoes <laughs> who just sit in front of it, and yeah. you don't have to think. Now, I grew up in the marvelous day of radio, theater of the mind, yeah. that really engaged, and you had to think, and you had to visualize, and you had to conclude. But with the picture, the th I mean, there's no creative imagination, there's no creative interaction. Yeah. But I really appreciate your saying that about the new book, Conspiracies and Secret Societies. Yeah. Because what we tried to do there, as you so aptly said, is from the standpoint of a historian. I, I've been a history buff since I was a kid. Yeah. My grandmother was the town librarian. Grandma Dina was the town librarian. And <clears throat> the library was originally just made up of her private library and she had histories of the world there hmm. that i was devouring when i was just a kid and i and because they were old books some of them i would read the text in school and saw that they left out so much <laughs> <laughs> there was so much left out yeah. and i realized Part of that is a very pragmatic thing, because as history goes on, it has to be condensed. Yeah. But that's not the fun, that's not the thrill of it. The thrill of it is to go back to the, as much far as you can, the original documents, yeah. and then really see what happened. And that's what I became fascinated by when I was just 9, 10, 11 years old. Yeah. And I remember I would get, I still remember, the first day of one class when a new teacher, he had just graduated from teacher's college, and he made a statement about Rome that I raised my hand and pointed out was patently false, that there was no <laughs> basis in that. Okay. And, of course, you can imagine how a young teacher reacted yeah, to that. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, well, all right, then, you do a paper on that. And I said, I'll do a paper, but let's say the same.